When you apply a material to an object that incorporates some sort of pattern or design, it's important that you build in some type of control as to how the pattern will be specifically wrapped or stamped onto that object surface. Max gives you that control by creating what are called mapping coordinates. And it's those coordinates that then help you in positioning the material's design on the object surface. Mapping coordinates, in layman's terms, are basically a set of wallpaper instructions that an object uses in order to properly position the map or maps that have been built into its material. Those mapping coordinate instructions typically come by way of adding a special modifier, a modifier known as UVW map. Let's take a look at how it works. This is a file named Mapping Coordinates, which can be found in the Working Files folder for this chapter. To show you what specifically happens when a pattern skinned hasn't been given the necessary instructions in order to wrap itself on or around an object, I've created a simple box model that'll illustrate just exactly what occurs when 3ds Max doesn't know what to do with the design that it's been given. Before Max is given a chance to notify us of the problem, let's first select the object so we can identify it by its name. At the top of the Modify column, you'll see that the object's name is Box Model. OK, let's now open up the Material Editor and apply a material. We'll go to the brick material located on the upper left-hand sample slot, grabbing it and dragging it down to the object in our scene. Verifying that the Show Shaded Material in Viewport has already been turned on, this doesn't bode well for our results. At this point in time, we ought to be seeing the brick pattern laying on top of the surface. If the object had been officially given a set of mapping instructions to follow, the pattern that's been built into the material should now be displaying within the shaded viewport, and it's not. Let's go ahead and render and we'll see how things turn out. OK, the dialog box that opens reads missing map coordinates at its top. The message is basically saying that the object listed below, our box model, requires mapping coordinates or may not render correctly. Well, maybe we'll get lucky on this one. Let's go ahead and simply click Continue. Well, we unfortunately didn't. 3ds Max was telling us that we hadn't prepped this object in a way that would allow it to properly render. The specific problem? The surface hasn't been given its formal How to Render papers. It has absolutely no idea as to how to wrap the material that's been applied to it so the design will come out looking right. It has no wallpaper instructions, in other words. So in that, 3ds Max is basically saying, yeah, I see the design in the material. I just don't know what you want me to do with it. It's going to be you applying that UVW map modifier that'll provide those much needed wrapping instructions. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll close both the rendering and our material editor. Then, entering the modifier list, we'll add the UVW map modifier. Take a look at that. That's all it took. With the modifier now added, we can see the material's design in our view. Let's go ahead and orbit around our object, taking a look at both the top and the bottom. We can do that with the Alt-Middle-Mouse-Wheel combo. If we then go ahead and render, we've fixed our mapping problem. So that's basically now what we want to take a closer look at. Applying mapping coordinates and how you then go about controlling those maps as they ride along the surfaces that they've been applied to. With the box model selected, let's go ahead and press Delete. We can then right-click on the screen, choosing Unhide by Name from the menu at the top right. From our list, let's select the cube. With it selected, let's go ahead and add the UVW map modifier. Let's then switch our viewport over to wireframe so we can get a closer look. We can do that by typing F3. The orange cage that you see in the middle of the cube is our UVW map modifier. Over in the right-hand column, you can see the various styles of mapping that we have to choose from. Let's go ahead and click on a couple of them to see how it changes the look of our orange cage. Here's cylindrical, spherical, and one called box. Let's go ahead and change our mapping style back to the default setting of planar. The planar mapping style will always be the default mapping type. In other words, the style that the modifier will be set to unless it's been changed to another wrapping style. Planar mapping works by projecting an image flat onto an object surface, kind of like the way a stamp would be placed on an envelope. Position onto the surface from a single direction. 
and that makes the planar mapping style perfect for anything flat. A wall, a floor, maybe a credit card or a flag. Again, anything that's flat. The orange cage that we've previously identified around the middle of the cube is officially called the modifier's gizmo. It basically serves to hold the picture or pictures that we've built into the object's material. The gizmo can be selected. Both its position and orientation on the object can then be adjusted. To select it, you open up the modifier in the stack, clicking down at the gizmo level. When selected, it turns primarily yellow in color. There are, though, a couple of additional markings on the gizmo that you want to be aware of. The little stem or stick that you see in the upper left-hand side represents the top of whatever map you have loaded in the material. The top of the image built into the skin, in other words. The green line on the upper right side indicates the location of the right-hand side of the map. Here's how everything works. With the UVW map gizmo holding the map or maps built into the material. If you move the gizmo, you essentially move the map or maps that are inside the gizmo. Make sense? You rotate the gizmo, the map's design spins along the object's surface. Scaling the gizmo makes the material's map appear larger or smaller as it's placed on the surface. So the gizmo directly controls both the position and orientation of whatever design has been built into the material. With the modifier gizmo currently pointing in the direction that it is, and it being designed to push or project the material's pattern or design from a single direction, the top of the box would be mapped correctly as would the bottom on the opposite end. Where the problems arise with planar style mapping, and you'll have problems, is on the other cross-facing or perpendicular sides on the object. What ends up happening is, the last dot of color going around the border of the map basically just drips, like hot wax, down the sides, creating usually a very noticeable streaking pattern. In fact, as we'll see with pretty much every mapping style, you're going to be having visual abnormalities with your mapping. Problems, in other words, that'll either need to be hidden, or if possible, fixed. It's unfortunately an issue that's just inherent with most styles of mapping. So expect there to be problems, and realize that those problems are going to need to be either hidden from your audience's view, or just plain fixed. Let's see if we can't find that streaking issue that I was describing. We'll take our view back to shade mode by typing F3. We can then return to the material editor. The middle material on the top row is named Desert. Let's go ahead and drag and drop that onto the cube in our scene. OK, there's the streaking problem that I was alluding to. The top and bottom of the object look good, but the last dot of color along the map's edge is just bleeding down the sides, creating a noticeable streak. You'll see that by orbiting around in the view. Let's see what moving the gizmo does to changing the way the map is positioned along the object's surface. Remember, you move the gizmo, and you move the map that's inside the gizmo. Let's fill in the gold box connecting both the red and green sticks on our transform gizmo, and we'll slide the mapping around. Once we've done that, let's position the mapping gizmo off to the upper right side. Now, the modifier does come with a series of helpful alignment commands that can be used to reposition the mapping. You'll find them a little further down in the Modify column in the Alignment category. With the mapping gizmo positioned off to the side of our cube, let's click on the Fit command. This snaps the map back to the extents of the object. In other words, repositioning and resizing if necessary the gizmo so it correctly fits the object. The fit command is something you'll be using all the time. Fast and efficient for getting the gizmo back in place. Let's scale the gizmo, making the picture on the box get bigger or smaller. When the gizmo gets larger, so does the image on the surface. Scaling the gizmo so it's smaller than the box begins to repeat the pattern on our map. Let's now position the gizmo like we did before on the upper right hand side of our view. Back in the Modify column, we also have a Center command. Designed to keep the gizmo the size that it is, but repositioning the gizmo back to the center of the object that it's been assigned to. Bound to the right of Fit, let's go ahead and click on Center. This takes the gizmo back to the center of our object. 
If we now click on Fit, the gizmo is again resized. You can see what that's done to the design in our material. Rotating the gizmo has the effect of spinning the map. Let's activate the command and spin things around. And when wanting to adjust the gizmo back to its original orientation and position, you can simply use the Reset option. You'll find it a couple of buttons below Fit. For quick and easy realignment, you've also got the X, Y, and Z alignment options. You'll find those at the top of the alignment category. Watch the way the mapping orientation switches around by changing to X. Let's try Y, then we'll go back to Z. There's also a handy command that allows you to align the mapping gizmo directly to a specific side or face that you select. The option's called Normal Align. You'll find it on the right-hand side, directly below Center. Here's how it works. We'll activate the option, then position our mouse directly on one of the sides of the cube. When we have it there, by clicking and moving our mouse, the gizmo reorients itself to that specific side. Continuing to hold the mouse down and moving to another side of the box realigns the mapping gizmo to that side instead. Let's put the gizmo back on the top and we'll again click Fit. Now, with an object of this shape, wanting not just a flat mapping style, but one that travels in all directions along the surface, a better projection method would be box which basically applies planar mapping to all six sides. Heading back up to the top of the commands, we'll change our style from planar over to box. This mapping method ideal for anything from a filing cabinet to a jewelry box to maybe a wooden crate. Okay, let's take a look at how you'd handle something cylindrically shaped. With the cube selected, we'll hit delete, then right click choosing unhide by name. When the dialog opens, we'll select the cylinder from the list. Now, before we go any further, you might be curious as to why we haven't had to worry about all this mapping stuff until now. I mean, we've made plenty of objects and we've certainly applied more than a few materials. Everything's been rendering fine each time out. That's because each and every primitive object in 3ds Max comes with a special setting called Generate Mapping Coordinates. The options designed to offer a generic style of mapping for that particular shape of object. Max slaps on what it hopes is an adequate style of wrapping and mapping, but something that has absolutely no control. If it doesn't do the job, you're pretty much stuck with the way things are. So the real solution is always to get in the habit of applying your own mapping. You've then got control over moving your designs and patterns however they need to be adjusted. So don't rely upon what Max gives you. Add your own UVW map modifier if you're serious about doing things right. See, here's the option on the cylinder. With the object selected, in the Modify column, you'll find the command down at the bottom of the settings. The box we just worked on had it too, we just didn't take note of it. In fact, let's see just how well that freebie mapping control on the cylinder handles the skin we apply. Let's open up the Material Editor and we'll drag the top right-hand side skin over to the cylinder. Take a look at the top of the object. Not something that I'm frankly very happy about. And without a mapping control in the stack, I've got nothing that I can adjust to fix the problem. Let's instead do it right by adding the UBW Map Modifier. Now the mapping always starts with the default setting of Planar. Let's change that to Cylindrical. The cylindrical style of mapping wraps a material around the surface, butting up the ends of the map in the back, which usually forms a seam. The style is best used for cylindrically shaped surfaces. Vases, soda cans, tree branches, telephone poles, maybe a character's leg, anything that's basically cylindrical. To solve the problem that we're still seeing on the top of the object, which by the way is also happening on the bottom, the mapping style has a special option called Cap, which maps both the top and bottom of the surface using planar coordinates. Let's go ahead and turn that on. As we orbit around the back, we'll see the problem that typically arises with cylindrical mapping, a seam. Many times, you just can't rid yourself of that unsightly seam. So if you can't rotate the object, you simply rotate the mapping, in other words, the gizmo. Back in the modifier stack, we'll open up the UV map entry getting down to the gizmo level. 
we can then rotate things around. Now as we do, specifically take note of the green line on the gizmo. This represents where the two sides of the map meet, in other words, the seam. We'll rotate things around and problem solved. I also turned off my edged faces so I could get a better look at the mapping. That was done by tapping F4 on the keyboard. Okay, let's take a look at dealing with round objects. We'll first delete the cylinder, then right click on the screen choosing Unhide My Name. From the list, we'll double click on Sphere. Selecting the object and heading over to the Modify column, we'll again see the Generate Mapping Coordinates option down at the bottom of the controls. Not wanting to rely on that, we'll go ahead and add our UVW Map Modifier. With the gizmo in place, we'll change the option from Planar over to Spherical. Spherical mapping works by wrapping a map around the object, then pinching the map together at both the top and bottom of the object's surface. It's best used on anything round, from planets to sports balls to certain shapes of fruit, like maybe a watermelon, apple, or orange. You could even use it to map a character's head. Again, anything round in nature. Let's reopen the Material Editor and we'll apply the skin on the lower left-hand side sample slot. If we now orbit around in the scene, we'll visually see the pinching that's happening at both ends of our sphere. Another option we could use for round objects is the shrink wrap style of mapping, which drapes the map over the top of the object, having it pinch only at the bottom. In the Modify column, we'll change the style of mapping from spherical to shrink wrap. Again, orbiting around in the scene, we'll see the mapping now draping over the top of the object while still pinching at the bottom. So which of the two styles is most appropriate to use on a round object? Well, that really needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. The bottom line is, you always want to use the one that looks best. Now, one more thing I'd like to talk about, and that's the face method of mapping which is designed to position a material's map on each and every face of an object. The pattern will get smaller and smaller on the object with each additional face that's included in the surface's geometry. You can see that by simply changing the number of segments on our sphere. I'll also reactivate edged faces so you can get a better idea of the actual number of segments on our object. So with a fewer number of faces, the design gets larger on top of the surface. OK, that'll give you what you need to know about mapping with the UVW Map Modifier. Any time that you've applied a material to an object that incorporates some kind of pattern or design, the UVW Map Modifier ought to be your first line of defense in controlling how that material will be positioned on your object surface. So remember, both your options and each mapping style's limitations. You do that and you'll be well on your way to precisely controlling the skins that you've created.